Hi everyone. So thank you very much for joining us today at the Birmingham Architectural Association event on the West Midlands Combined Authority Recovery Environmental Recovery Plan. If this is your first time at the BAA event and you are not familiar with us, the Birmingham Architectural Association is the, is the local branch of the RIBA here in Birmingham. Founded in 1874 and relaunched three years ago, we are represented by architects, architectural technologists, interior designers, engineers, and many more built environmental, sorry, environment professionals in the local area who have an interest and passion in architecture and the built environment. Run by a community of people from a variety of practices based in the city, our aim is to promote, support, and share knowledge through our community. <clears throat> our upcoming events, um, we have uh, Calling All Creators Home. Uh, Sunday, the 27th of September is uh, Brum Architecture Design Competition. The midnight is the submission deadline, so you still have a little bit of time. The show will be a creative platform to showcase and celebrate creative work from across the UK. We aim to create an inclusive platform to bring creatives together. We will showcase creative design work with a strong connection to home. We welcome entries from students, professionals, families and groups. We'll be hosting the exhibition online and awarding the very first Birmingham Architectural Creative Design Award to the category winners. Our categories are family, professional and student. And this BAA event wouldn't be possible without a number of partners and sponsors. Thanks to these organisations, we are able to deliver a huge programme of events and activities all year round. I'd just like to say a thank you to Alamir, Ipstock, Marley, Delta Light, FRA, Taylor Maxwell, All Good, Armitage Shanks, Milliken, Kitchen Gallery, Outro and Rainers. We're very lucky to have great supporters. So today, our amazing presenter is Jackie Holman from West Midlands Combined Authority, aka the WMCA. In June 2019, the WMCA declared a climate emergency and in January 2020 released its climate change strategy. The ambition to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2041 will require action and collaboration across multiple sectors through a range of projects and programs. Many of these will have significant co-benefits that will uh, be especially important as we recover from COVID-19. The WMCA has put green at the heart of its plans for recovery and this talk will explore some of those as well as the way the WMCA will be working to ensure effective delivery and how and where you can get involved. Jackie Homan is currently Head of Environment at the WMCA, where she oversees the delivery of WM 2041, the region's climate change strategy. The most, recent, uh, most recently, she has led on the com combined authorities' work on green recovery from COVID-19. Jackie has previously worked in city City's team and climate KIC and was formerly head of sustainability at Birmingham City Council. Jackie, good to see you. Thank you very much, um, Matt, for the introduction and thank you for having me to, to speak to you today. Um, it's really good to be able to talk about some of the work that we're doing. So um, I'm just going to spend probably about half an hour going through our plans um, and what the WMCA is, as well as some of our strategic ambitions around climate change and some of the actions that we're looking to take forward um, in the immediate, um, medium and longer term. So if it's okay, Matt, I'll work through my slides. Absolutely fine. Guys, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will answer at the, at the end. So oh, take it away, Jackie. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I should probably start also by saying that um, I'm going to talk about a whole range of actions that we're putting in place from um, natural environment through to the built environment and energy projects. Um, I'm not a technical expert in any of those areas in particular. So if you do have very technical questions, I'm happy to take those away and find the answers for you. Um, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the breadth of programme that we're working on um, in relation to WM2041. Um, I thought it was worth starting off by just telling you a little bit about um, the West Midlands Combined Authority, um, because I don't like to assume that, that everyone knows exactly what that is. Um, 
it was formally constituted in 2016. So it's still a relatively young organisation, although some of the authorities that form particularly um, the constituent parts have been collaborating for a long time around um, areas like transport, for example. Um, the current mayor is Andy Street. Uh, we were due to have mayoral elections, as you probably know, this year, but they have been postponed until next year uh, in light of COVID-19. Um, and the mayors uh, across the UK will all be re-elected or elected new, new mayors coming in um, so that the, um, the voting across all the combined authorities is aligned. So um, there'll be elections in London and Manchester and, and in all the combined authorities. In terms of the West Midlands, we have seven constituent authorities, um, which you can see in the darker orange on the map here. And they are Coventry, Solihull, Birmingham, and then the four black country authorities of Wolverhampton, Walsall, Dudley and Samwell. Um, those are the voting members at the combined authority. We also have some non-constituent authority members um, and we also have um, the LEPs form part of the combined authority. So the area you see on there is, is the total area, um, but the constituent authorities form the main part. Uh, and when we're talking about climate change and some of the programmes that I'll be talking about today, that the geography tends to flex as well so um, you know some of the programs we're working on more closely with um, just the seven authorities and others we go beyond that. In terms of climate change um, we have a working relationship with uh, low carbon officers right across the constituent authority area. We catch up every six weeks to talk about the work that we're doing uh, and it's important to point out that I'll be talking about WN 2041 as the regional plan but all many of the local authorities have their own climate plans uh, and some are looking to work to um, a, a sooner a quicker date than the, the combined authority so Birmingham for example has a 2030 date by which it wants to be net zero carbon. Uh, in terms of the political structure, we have an environment portfolio holder, that's the leader of Solihull Council, uh, Councillor Ian Courts, um, and the decisions in relation to climate change are made at the Energy and Environment Board. So that's all I really want to say about the structure, but it's just helpful for you to be able to see the context in which we're working. Um, in terms of climate change itself, uh, we talk about our plan as WM2041. Uh, that is the date by which we are looking to be net zero carbon emissions. Uh, that was a date that was identified by um, work the Tyndall Centre in Manchester did for us. This plan here was produced at the end of last year and was approved by the Combined Authority Board in January this year. Um, it's been through a consultation process and I'll give you some high level feedback that we had from that, um, but has more recently been followed up by a plan that is looking to translate both the feedback from the consultation as well as some of the actions in the plan into a green recovery plan um, as we start to um, think about what a post-COVID life might look like or um, you know, how we're going to move forward in the current context. So as part of the consultation on this plan, which has 73 actions in it, um, we spoke to members of the public and also businesses and organisations. Uh, and you can see here some of the feedback that we had, and this is, this is very high level, um, but provides some important framing, I think, for some of the decisions that we've taken since. So the feedback we had was that we will need to put a clear action plan in place and that's something that we are just about to start work on. Uh, that we will need to consider governance and who needs to deliver on what. So as I mentioned the local authorities are all working on their own climate plan so um, we are really mindful of the principle of subsidiarity and what is best delivered at what kind of spatial level so that's something that we'll be working on in all our projects and programs 
Um, we need to be transparent in our monitoring and we took a decision to report into the carbon disclosure project this year uh, and I think that's something that will continue, continue annually going forwards to be clear on how we are progressing towards our target and the kinds of programmes that we're putting in place. When we asked the public um, what they felt um, were, should be our main priorities in terms of tackling climate change, active travel came forward, bearing in mind this was pre-COVID, um, and energy efficiency. Interestingly, working at home was one of the bottom initiatives, which probably be quite different if you ask people now. Um, but it's interesting to see active travel is there because that's one of our key programs that we're putting in place as part of COVID recovery work. Um, people generally felt that they wanted more support and advice on how to do the right thing. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at taking forward is how we deliver a really effective behaviour change programme, um, working with communities, businesses, um, acknowledging that tackling climate change and reaching 2041 is going to be something that's going to require um, a, a, um, action and an approach working right across the relevant stakeholders. Um, but people want to be continue to be involved in addressing climate change. They want to be informed on what we're doing. Uh, but there are still a significant minority of climate change sceptics out there. So there are people that think we shouldn't be doing anything in this space at all. So this was the feedback we had and then COVID-19 happened. So it was a case of moving from that consultation into thinking about the actions we might prioritise in terms of tackling climate change. Thinking about these three things, that we don't want to go back to business as usual. There are things that we would like to retain and I'll touch on those as I go through the various projects and programmes we're looking to put in place. But also that the, the green economy can offer an opportunity to go forward and that there are opportunities um, in job creation, um, in economic growth that sit alongside addressing climate change. So what are the co-benefits uh, and being clear on the co-benefits of putting some of these projects and programmes into, play, into, into place that also have um, economic and social opportunity. So we're thinking about all these things um, in relation to uh, things we could do immediately, things we want to do over the next 12 months, and also in the context of five-year delivery plans. Um, and just to put that into context, you can see along the top our timeline. So we declared a climate emergency in June last year. Uh, in January, we published that paper that I flashed up at the beginning. And in June, our programme for implementing an environmental recovery was published. There's a link right at the end of this presentation to our environment pages, uh, where you can find the various reports and initiatives that we're working on. So in that um, June 2020 paper, in that environmental recovery plan, we've touched on five key areas. And I'm going to give you examples of the work that we're doing on each of these um, at a fairly high level and then I'm happy to take questions or provide more information on any of those. Um, so we're looking at nature and natural capital um, and for that we're looking at um, a, a local level but also right across the region. So Birmingham City University have been developing the concept of a West Midlands National Park um, and we're looking to work with them on, on how we deliver and develop that. Looking at buildings, um, both in terms of retrofit, but also new build. Uh, looking at the energy transition, and we have um, an organisation called Energy Capital that sits alongside the West Midlands Combined Authority and is doing much of our work on retrofit, but also things like energy innovation, um, and transitioning to low carbon energy. Uh, transport and mobility, particularly around active travel and electric mobility and the circular economy. So as I said, I'll, I'll delve into them a little bit more um, as I go through the next few slides. And then we felt, and this particularly came through the consultation, that it was going to be really important to break down that 2041 target into more manageable chunks. 
Um, so looking at a carbon budget over five years, looking at the investment that would be required, looking at the types of projects and programmes we'll need to put in place, um, as well as some of the other initiatives that we'll need to, to think about, um, bearing in mind that different sectors will be moving at different paces. So we're doing that piece of work and I will start off by talking a little bit about that. Um, so the pie chart you see there, it came from the Tyndall Centre work. Um, it basically shows the emissions for the combined authority area. Um, we are going with a 2016 baseline and we've got some pretty stretching interim targets to achieve in order to reach 2041. Uh, like many other places, uh, we've got roughly a third, third, third emissions um, on um, energy, domestic and um, transport. And so what we really wanted to do was to understand, you know, not just what we've got to do, but how we're going to do it, um, how we're going to try and find the financing to deliver it. Um, what are the investments um, and how do they stack up against potential carbon savings? Uh, and that's a question I'm asked quite a lot. You know, what is it or where is it we should be focusing our investment to maximize carbon savings? Um, what are the priority programs of work? So if we're going to start, where do we need to start and what do we need to start on and who needs to deliver on what so some clarity around you know what the local authorities need to be doing what do we need to be doing where might we need devolution of powers where do we need to be identifying resources um, and i think being able to put it into a plan where we have a really clear evidence base will be quite powerful and will give confidence to people that are making decisions um, around the 2041 plan and around investments and programs that they are looking to put in place. Um, one of the other things that we're doing that will sit alongside this as well is also looking at carbon literacy. So given that um, we are looking for people to make different considerations when they are planning programs and investments, particularly thinking about the um, CO2 emissions, we might be expecting them to do that with actually very little um, knowledge or expertise in this particular area. And so we're thinking about how we actually uh, improve the carbon literacy and how we support staff, politicians in that space. So that's a big piece of work as well that we're looking to do that I think we'll need to sit alongside this if this is to be really effective. Um, we've just um, we, we've just been out to tender on this and we're going to be working with WSP on the five-year plans um, and the, they'll be complete by December this year. Um, so we're quite excited about these and I think they'll show the real scale of the challenge going forward. Um, so to break down, I mentioned, you know, the various areas and I've mixed them all up a bit um, in here and I'm literally just going to go through um, some of the work that we're doing just so that you can see the, the variety um, of initiatives and programmes that we're looking at taking forward. So one of the pieces of work was around community green grants and this has been part of one of our priorities um, in relation to the, the green recovery plan. Uh, particularly because um, we've seen how people have started to really value access to green space um, in a way that perhaps they didn't before or weren't as aware of before. Um, so just to draw on some work that the RSPB have done, um, in a report that they've published, uh, they found out that 76% um, of, of people responding to the survey supported the suggestion that nature could contribute to an economic recovery from COVID-19. Um, but we also know that there is real inequality of access to green space. Um, so nationally, they found that um, in the UK, if you have a household income of under 10,000 pounds, you're 3.6 times 
more likely to have no outdoor space um, and 40% less likely to live within a 10 minute walk of public green space than people that have got a household income of 60,000 pounds or more. So we were, it, we were interested in finding out what that meant in the West Midlands. So we're doing some work with the New Economics Foundation who published a blog on access to green space during COVID-19 lockdown. Um, and we're starting to see that there's huge variation across the WMCA area in terms of access. Um, they're using the 2020 Green Space Index that's been published by Ordnance Survey and then having catch up conversations with local authorities to make sure that that is um, making sense to them and is, is an accurate representation of the green space in their local authority area. We're then overlaying it with um, indices of multiple deprivation, um, with age um, parameters and also um, looking at access amongst BAME communities too. Uh, and what it's showing is um, where there is pressure on green space and also where there is um, inequality of access due to distance from green space. And what we're looking to do with that data once we've got it, and you can see an example map that um, has been part of the work with Sandwell, um, but we've got these right across the combined authority now, is to see where we might need to target initiatives working with communities um, and how we can get people involved on the ground. And I've had quite a lot of interest in the data and also how we're going to work with it moving forward from DEFRA um, and also from the RSPB who have shown real interest in maybe being able to engage with us um, on some of these community projects. So that should be really interesting and is a real watch this space um, program of activity. Uh, another area where we want to really understand what the potential is, is around the circular economy. Um, so we know that there is likely to be the potential not just for carbon reduction, but also for um, social and economic benefit for job creation across the West Midlands. There's already some really interesting things happening, um, both in businesses, so RICO doing some really good stuff, and also from support organisations, so international synergies are doing some great stuff. Um, around industrial symbiosis and working with businesses in the region. But what we really answers, want to understand is what is the opportunity right across the West Midlands in a way that the London Waste and Recycling Board have done with the circular economy plan in London. So what is the scale of the opportunity? What is the potential for job creation um, across a whole number of sectors that you can see in that little diagram on the right? So you know, we're looking at the construction sector, manufacturing, um, waste and energy, food. So trying to bring in um, multiple sectors to the conversation. So we've had, and you can see from the timeline on the left, we've had an initial kickoff workshop to understand from a wide range of sectors what they think, if it's a good idea, what's already happening, because, you know, we know there's stuff happening, as I've said. Um, and we're looking to set up a task force uh, to really drill down and take this forward and, and own a route map around the circular economy. So what can we be getting on with straight away? Um, what do we need to invest in? Um, what kind of conditions do we need to create in order for the circular economy to flourish? And so I think that's an opportunity where people are interested to get involved and to help. Um, as I said, for many of these things, we're looking to um, stakeholders and other organisations in the region um, to really help us drive some of these things and take them forward. So this is something we're in the early stages of, but we're really excited about where this might go and the potential around the circular economy regionally. Uh, another example is retrofits. Um, and we had a document called Recharge the West Midlands, um, which was submitted to central government, again, as part of COVID recovery. Uh, this is publicly available. Um, I think you just need to search for the document title and it should come up on our 
website. So this is something that Energy Capital is leading on. I mentioned them uh, as an organization working on energy and energy efficiency. Um, there are two priorities as part of our retrofit work. The first one is around tackling fuel poverty, of which improving people's homes is one element. Um, and that is about doing some very quick energy efficiency measures on targeted properties. Um, and the value that we put on that was around 50 million pounds to bring in some seed funding to be able to deliver that as a program across the region. The second was around scaling up retrofit and supply chain development. Again, the funding that we requested was um, seed funding in order to get things moving. Um, and we've got a, a rough estimate that there's probably about 600,000 homes that need retrofitting in the seven met area, um, which if we're to meet our target of 2035, which is in our climate plan, will mean retrofitting 40,000 homes a year, which is 160 a day. So it's a really um, significant challenge um, and one where I think the solution sits in the financing and how that is organised and arranged regionally and locally. Uh, we've now got the Green Homes grants and we're trying to understand what that might mean. Um, but I think ultimately we're really looking to understand how we can put in a regional program that can help us crack this particular issue. Um, so Energy Capital have got a number of working groups established to really try and look at that and understand what needs to happen um, to really get this moving. Um, we also want to work with um, businesses uh, as much as we can in order to deliver on the climate plan. Uh, there's a couple of things that we've got underway. Um, the first is in relation to a business pledge, which came out of the Mayor's Economic um, Impact Group. Uh, that's a group of businesses that meet to look at recovery from COVID, not just in a green way, but across the board. Um, we know, as I've said, delivering will take a collective effort. And one of the things we want to do is to work with business to understand the best way of doing that. So what can we do as a region to support businesses? What do businesses need from us? How can we support small businesses right up to um, working with um, some of our larger um, businesses that are working in the region? And the, um, the suggestion that came forward from the business community is that they would like to co-create a business pledge um, with us to understand how we can collectively take action. So again, that's something else where there is opportunity to get involved. We haven't started working on that. It's just an idea and we're, we're going to be talking to a few different businesses around how we can most effectively do that. So again, that's another area to get involved um, as is the clean innovation challenge. So we're working with 5G um, on some of our most pressing challenges in those five areas. Um, so around natural capital, circular economy, buildings, um, energy and transport. Um, we've put together a list of challenges and they're going to put them through their three-stage accelerator. Um, the, the different stages are called engage, explore and exploit. Um, that's going to be launching on Friday. Uh, and it's really understanding how we can get some good ideas from small innovative businesses that might otherwise find it quite tricky to respond to a procurement from an organization like ours. So they will get to work alongside us and alongside other organizations that have interest in those areas. So we're still working out who we want to work with on some of those challenges. Um, so again, that's another opportunity to get involved in, in working with us if that's something that's, um, that's interesting. I mentioned at the start the West Midlands National Park. So this is something that Birmingham City University are leading on. Um, and the idea is about taking a, a landscape approach to planning to create a regional park. So looking at a region wide spatial vision that starts to look at how we plan our places and spaces in a different way. 
um, and they are developing a pipeline of projects that we might be able to roll out as part of the national park concept and you can see examples of what some of those projects might include so sequences of parks and squares uh, public uh, publicly accessible clean rivers so you know there's an there's a really significant river network across the west midlands but actually being able to access it is quite tricky um, looking at uh, celebrating regional food through allotments um, urban agricultural networks food markets so a whole range of things that fit into that concept of a national park and, and when we say national park it's not um, it's not in the um, the formal context of the Lake District or the Peak District we're not looking at putting planning restrictions in place for example it's about celebrating um, what we have in the region um, and looking at how we take a different view and I think that's going to be really important as we come out of COVID and look at um, what the future might be in terms of some of our town and city centres actually what can an approach like this offer for a different way of, of thinking in those places. Um, also on a natural capital theme we have um, an initiative called the West Midlands Virtual Forest. This is what the website will look like but it hasn't been launched yet. Um, one of the things that I found when I started in my role at the West Midlands Combined Authority was there were lots of groups doing some really interesting things but were very localized um, and not necessarily joined up in the way that um, can show the collective efforts that they were putting in so we thought well what can we do to support the joining up um, and collective action so we came up with this idea of a virtual forest um, it was based on some work that New York had done. They had a, a program called A Million Trees NYC where they'd connected communities to tree planting opportunities. And so this is one of the things that we're looking to take forward. We've got a tree planting target of 4 million trees by 2041. Um, and so to do that, we're going to need to work with a whole range of different organizations. So this website is really just to steer people um, to talk about the news amongst those groups to talk about um, the tree planting opportunities um, and for people to be able to register their trees. So there's a map that will come up when the site goes live that shows where all the trees are that have been planted, what types of trees they are and so on. So um, this is just a really good way to connect um, all those smaller groups right across the, um, the, the region. Um, we're also working on a zero carbon homes project. So this is not something that's led by my team. This is being led by the housing and regen team. Um, and you can see from the aims that are there, the scale of the house building that's going to be taking place. And when we're talking about um, the region here, we're looking at the wider West Midlands um, region that I showed on the initial map. Um, and one of the things that's pressing here is how can we make those homes zero carbon so the housing and regen team are working with um, an organization called really useful projects to understand that in a bit more detail and they're looking to develop a zero carbon homes charter and route map um, to support the transition to net zero construction um, and they're engaging with relevant stakeholders uh, and this piece of work was kicked off with a really good workshop we held in conjunction with the UK Green Building Council and some of the local members um, for the UK Green Building Council's West Midlands group um, came along to that and, and helped out with, um, with kicking some of this work off. So um, this again is a watch this space, but there should be some um, reports and communications coming out from the combined authority on this particular piece of work. Um, I think I just have a couple more things to talk through um, just to show you the, the range of things we're looking at. Um, this one relates to active travel and some of the work we're doing having access the emergency active travel funds that the Department for Transport um, were working with. 
Uh, so you can see on here, um, these, are, these show the range of different areas where we're working at the minute. Um, so where there are pop-up cycle lanes and footway improvements, they're in purple. Um, where there are cycling and walking improvements that are in yellow. Um, and this is the work that's coming out of the first tranche of funding. Uh, and there will be other tranches coming forward as the work is delivered. Um, so as I said, they're working on things like pop-up cycle lanes, widening pavements. Um, and this again is really responding to some of the things that came out from the WM 2041 consultation, where people were suggesting that active travel was one of the ways that they would like us to, um, to be delivering projects and programs to support climate change in the region. Um, and also responds to some of the, um, the feedback that Transport for West Midlands have done uh, as part of a survey they've done um, in relation to COVID-19, where 81% of people supported initiatives that would deliver cleaner air going forward. And 75% said they were keen to retain the re traffic reductions that we'd seen during lockdown. Um, and also using that survey, you've seen, we've seen some of the increases in active travel. So uh, before COVID, 8% of people were walking to the shops, for example, and then 40% of people have been walking since COVID. So we've seen an uptake in active travel um, and people engaging in active travel, but it's how do we retain that um, as we start to ease out of lockdown and people start to go back to work and go back to school? Um, you know, how do we hang on to that enthusiasm to engage with active travel? Um, and the last initiative I wanted to talk about was in relation to energy. Uh, and I'm really sorry, this is a really poor quality graphic, but. Um, this is Tisley Energy Park in Birmingham, um, and it's one of the energy innovation zones that Energy Capital is working with and supporting. And what they're really trying to do is to work with um, Bayes and the regulator to see um, how we can transform um, the um, energy sector in spaces and places. So um, how do we use local generation how do we build in storage um, and how does that work across local networks so how do we um, for example support increasing electrification how do we support the hydrogen infrastructure in places so um, this again is a piece of work that's ongoing um, and will be developing as we go forward there are energy innovation zones across the West Midlands Combined Authority area. This particular one is in Birmingham, um, but there's one in Coventry, there's one in the Black Country. So um, we're looking at trialing different types of um, solutions and, and also addressing different types of problems in the different energy innovation zones. Um, so I think that will be a really important piece of work as we go forward and is something that other areas in the country are also um, becoming interested in. So there's been some dialogue, for example, with Cornwall Council around what this might mean in a rural context. Um, so it's just providing some exciting opportunities and also builds on some of the local expertise we have in our universities, for example, as well. Um, so I hope that was helpful. Um, that was just to give you a very quick overview of our climate plan and some of the projects and programmes we're looking to put in place which I hope you know, we'll be able to develop. Um, and you know, once we've got the five year plans in place, we will be able to look at some of the other things that we know we're going to need to do and deliver on. And you know, we really want to be able to do it collectively with all the organizations that have an interest in this space across the West Midlands. So you can see just popped up here, that's my contact information. We also have, because my inbox is quite frankly a complete car crash, there is also a general um, email address that you can see there um, where we'll be able to also respond to messages because that's checked not just by me, but also others in my team um, and the web pages for the work that we do at the Combined Authority. So I hope that was helpful.
That was great. Thank you, Jackie. No, really interesting. Um, we have got several, quite a few questions, so I'll hand over to Georgie. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, Matt, I loved your kind of Desert Island disc intro to Jackie. That was great. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is Jackie's life. This is wonderful. <laughs> uh, Jackie, I could speak to you all day about everything that's come across, like all the topics you've spoken about. Um, but I'm going to, for this purpose, I'm just going to go through about, I think there's about six questions that we've got. Okay. Um, so the first one came from Robin Tom uh, from SAP Ratings and he said compared to other major cities including Lon London, Manchester and neighbouring authorities how does this compare to what Birmingham had been targeting previously with respect to environmental targets being set for new construction for example? Um, so how does, how does, so our environment work I guess is is younger than that that is taking place in Manchester and um, London so not so much in the constituent authorities who've been working on this for a while um, I've been in post since November last year so um, you know we launched the climate plan we went through the consultation I think we're now really understanding exactly what it is we need to do so in terms of um, our ambitions we're really trying to nail those down now um, I'm not sure specifically in relation to the built environment how we compare um, in terms of reaching net zero Manchester's date is 2038 um, whereas ours is 2041 um, but obviously within our dates some of our cities and authorities are going faster than that but in terms of the built environment specifically I'm not sure I was going to ask actually how did you come to the kind of year of 2041 was there a reason for that um so the Tyndall Centre in Manchester came up with our targets so they set the targets for many of the local authorities across the country it's almost become the standards I would imagine 90% of them have had their targets set by the Tyndall Centre yeah. um, and they use the um, they use the scatter tool as well so um, it, it's really it's comparable right across the UK I would suggest yeah. but it they set the target and it was um, in line with the Paris Agreement um, more so than in line with the UK target because it takes on things like the equity principles where developed countries are expected to go faster um, which is why it's 2041 and faster than the UK government target. And you, and you like to think as well with Birmingham's target of 2030 it will kind of encourage kind of quicker change anyway to reach that 2041 uh, like target anyway I suppose. Yeah yeah, I think the you know we're not certainly going to discourage people from going quicker, um, yeah. and I think it's it's looking as I said what we can do most effectively as a regional authority by way of support for what local authorities are doing as well as some of the things that just sit with us to deliver. So transport for West Midlands, for example, um, sits within the combined authority, and so there are things that they will get on with and they're responsible for the statutory transport plan um, but other areas it will be a case of influence and collaboration um, yeah. and understanding what is best delivered at what level yeah absolutely so the next question is from Ian Howell in Innover Systems uh, being a commentary based manufacturer I'd like to know the appetite of the supply chain to utilize local manufacturers and if there is a portal to support and provide visibility Okay, so um, I'm not sure uh, what Coventry City Council do. We have a procurement portal um, where people can see what opportunities are, are coming up. Um, so I'm, I'm not specifically sure about Coventry, but we definitely have a portal that people can um, subscribe to so you can see what opportunities are coming up locally. Uh, the next question is from Hannah Smith at Arup. Has there been any discussion so far of moving away from growth as a measure of good economic outcomes to an alternative measure? So that was quite a good question. <laughs> what a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
we have a, so I sit, my work on um, climate change sits within um, a directorate the combined authority called the Public Service Reform Directorate. It's nice and snappy. As part well, of pretend. that, just does, doesn't it? PSR. Um, as part of that, we have an inclusive growth unit who have um, an inclusive growth toolkit and are supporting other ways that we should look at value and growth. So they work, for example, um, their inclusive growth toolkits based on the donor economics model. Um, and that is also in our climate change plan, along with um, the UN SDGs. So I would say at the minute, the, the approach we have is to stress co-benefits of what we're doing other than just economic growth so what are the environmental and social benefits has that become mainstream no um, but there are people working on it and supporting it as part of a whole load of checks and balances we have at the combined authority um, which sit under what we call the single assurance framework so when you are writing something around a project or program, you have to be mindful of these other strategies. So WM2041 is one, um, but also inclusive growth is another. Um, but it's not by any means straightforward. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the other reason why we're looking at this issue of carbon literacy, um, is that we're now asking people to make decisions and build programs in quite a different way um, through things like addressing climate change or inclusive growth without perhaps any prior knowledge of what that means or how to do it. Uh, and so it's how do you then um, upskill the organization to be mindful of those other things? So yeah, it is a really good question. Yeah. So the next one is this from, from Matt Redding. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, he has asked, how will materials be reused within a retrofit scale up the, and supply chain? Oh, up, is that up the supply chain? Sorry, Matt. Uh, yeah, so how will, basically, how will reuse materials fit within your retrofit? Um, you were talking about your scale up and supply chain yeah. kind of uh, strategy. So how does that, how does that tie in? So I think that's definitely something we'll be looking at as part of this circular economy route map. Um, and the circular economy club supported us on that piece of work. And actually we were on the, the phone with them this morning and they were talking about some Dutch examples of exactly that, um, that they, they, um, I don't know, been alerted to, um, recently, but I think we will definitely be looking as part of that circular economy route map to actually understand what are the big projects and programs we're going to be working on and delivering and then how does the circular approach support some of those things so i would i would definitely hope that that's something um that we will look at and support because i think it's it's really important yeah. um yeah yeah i watched a lecture a little while ago with De duncan baker brown and it, that's basically his whole model is understanding what's around him so then he can feed them into a project and yeah it's kind of missing at the moment that kind of understanding of what materials you can get from where as like an inventory across the UK yeah yeah that would be that would be great to have um so next one is I'm not sure who this is from I'm just going to say it's anonymous uh how do we push our local MPs to engage with this agenda Ooh. um so we have, in my role, I mainly work with local politicians. We have written and um, informed our local MPs as we've gone along about the work. So when we launched the climate plan, um, we wrote out to them all to say that it had been launched. And this was an initiative we were working on. Um, to be honest, I don't think we heard back from any of them. <laughs> Um, so I think it is about you know how do we maximize that engagement we have a public affairs team at the combined authority I should say we're also a team of two and a graduate at the combined authority so you know there's there's a limit on 
what we're able to do in terms of engagement and um, getting out there and talking to people. I would see local politicians as being critical. And I know clearly people way above my pay grade ensure that local politicians are kept informed um, on the work that we're doing, but how prominent the climate change plans feature in those conversations, I'm not sure. Um, but we we do let them know what we're doing and we have done and we've sent them our plans and strategies but it's been quite a one-way flow of information i would suggest yeah I, I found that i've tried to engage with my mp about various things and, and actually they don't seem like because uh, i'm in Stourbridge, they don't seem like they're very knowledgeable but my colleague katie she's emailed her mp and they seem much more knowledgeable in birmingham so yeah. I think it's probably about just engagement with them and kind of talking about these things with them yeah. just from a one on one level, just emailing them as well, even just so it's highlighted to them again and again. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and I think that's another thing where actually if you can um, galvanize interest and, um, you know, public concern with some of these things, that's really where um, people power comes into its own as well with people saying you know this is important i know um andy street received a lot of emails about natural capital and you know the importance of nature as part of the recovery um during lockdown um and so you know people are where people write to politicians it definitely pushes interest i think um up, up the agenda so um, I think that's where you need to get communities involved and interested in some of these issues to help keep that pressure up. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, the next one is, how will the general public be made aware of this agenda? Will there be funding made available to local community groups who are keen to engage in this? Yes, yeah, so on the green grants, um, I have submitted as part of our comprehensive spending review um, an ask around natural capital uh, and community involvement. Um, I don't know what will come out of that process, but that's something that's been submitted into government. Um, I think in terms of wider community involvement, people have asked us to support it. Um, a big part of that obviously sits with our local authority partners as well, who have clear channels of communication to their communities um, and residents. And so it's thinking again about where can we add value in that space as a combined authority. Um, one of the things that we're looking to do is to send out um, messaging around what people can do because that's something people asked us for through the consultation process um, and also looking at you know what we might be able to do around um, behavior change campaigns acknowledging that we also bear the responsibility of creating the conditions under which people are able to change their behavior so not just pushing it out to people saying you know, you've got to change and you've got to cycle more but actually what can we do to support that um but i that will be an important part of our work um going forward and you know it's something that needs to be built into um to every project and program so a consideration of how people can work with the initiatives that we put out you know what does good look like for a resident of the West Midlands for a particular project or program so I think it needs to be central to what we do um, on climate change particular in particular um, we're doing what we can around um, comms but it will need resourcing going forward we don't have it yet <laughs> <laughs> I think we've that got reminds me. one more Georgie if you've got one more sorry yeah I'm trying to pick one okay <laughs> I'm sorry no you were saying rem you, it reminds you of yeah it reminds me of I was just watching a like country file one time and there was a woman that was like her view was out towards the lovely reservoir in London and she was like I have a, I'm privileged to have this view and I was thinking you know actually everyone should have that option of a green view and that mm. actually should be part of the development plan and identifying those green spaces actually you know that it should yeah. just be normal it shouldn't it, 
be unusual that you can't get access to green space and I got really frustrated actually. <laughs> We had, a, we had a really interesting talk a while back, uh, I know, uh, George, you were there, in, from uh, Jane uh, Findlay, uh, who is the uh, president of the Landscape Institute, who did a really interesting talk on kind of where these green spaces are or could be within Birmingham and certainly the, the areas around. So, yeah, quite, quite interesting, those, that kind of linking is, is, is going on, so yeah. encouraging. <laughs> And amazing that COVID has brought that to the forefront as well. It's made people realise as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to do one more. This might be quite specific, Jackie, um, but see if you can give it a go. Um, <laughs> with the incoming Birmingham Clean Air Scheme, it seems unfair to penalise disabled people who need to access central parking spaces. Are there any further allowances to help out those that are quite often on lower wages and trying to avoid public transport due to infection concerns? So um, this is going to sound like a complete cop-out and really isn't, but the clean, the clean air zone um, sits within the remit of, of Birmingham City Council. So I genuinely don't know the detail around specific allowances um, that are being made. I do know that they pushed back the launch. Um, it was due to happen in summer this year and because of COVID restrictions and the need for people to use personal transport, it was put forward to, or put back, should I say, to January next year. Um, but I, gen I genuinely don't know what the latest is around that um, to be able to give you an intelligent response. Yeah. I thought that was the case. Yeah, it's quite specific, isn't it? I did think that. Yeah, the clean air zone is. We're doing, we're doing work on air quality, but the clean air zone and the administration around it is a Birmingham City Council um, issue. Yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, I just wanted to say, though, it's quite exciting to be in this kind of time where things are changing and green yeah. issues are coming to the forefront as well. I, I think it's really exciting, and it's really exciting to hear these kind of targets and how we're going to move forward with it and I just hope it all people just see the benefits of it sooner rather than later really and just yeah. really do actions quicker really that's what I want to see anyway yeah and I think momentum's building in a different way now so prior to COVID we had obviously the the um we had Extinction Rebellion and we had Greta Thunberg was all over the news and there was a real pressure mounting hence the climate emergencies that were declared last year i think the pressure is there i think it just looks a bit different now mm -hmm. um, as we recover from covid so it is around things like access to green space it is around jobs but making sure they're green jobs so i think climate change is there it's just in a different context now yeah. mm -hmm. definitely yeah it's been shaped differently hasn't it absolutely yeah well, thank you, Jackie, so much for uh, for talking to us uh, this evening, well, this afternoon. And um, uh, I want to uh, quick say to thank you to all our, our sponsors and partners. And um, again, uh, thank you, Georgie, for for uh, <laughs> helping me with the with the questions, yeah, and um, and Katie in the background there as well. Um, but yeah, so thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, this will be up on the website. Uh, please check it out, brumarchitecture.com. And um, we shall see you, hopefully, at the next event. Thank you, Jackie, again. Thanks. <laughs>